Welcome to the Stay Healthy El Paso podcast, where we help El Pasoans get away from taking pain medications, avoid getting injections, avoid surgery, and keeping up an active lifestyle. This podcast is presented to you by Dr. David Midoff, expert physical therapist and owner of El Paso Manual Physical Therapy. It is our goal and intentions to provide you with valuable tips and insights from experts in the El Paso area so you too can stay healthy, fit, and energized. Now here is your host, Dr. David. Hey El Paso, welcome to the Stay Healthy El Paso podcast. I'm your host, Dr. David Midoff, physical therapist. I'm the owner over at El Paso Manual Physical Therapy. We're going to cover today knee pain and all the treatment options. We're going to be pretty exhaustive about all the possible treatment options you could take if you're dealing with a knee problem. Now, before we get into the meat of this episode, you know, going over all the details about the treatment options, let's just talk about the big idea. You can pretty much divide all of these treatment options I'm going to go into into a, a short-term treatment option and a long-term treatment option. Now, I tell you this because most people don't talk about this. Um, if you're searching up knee pain treatment options on the internet, you're probably not going to find it labeled that way. You're not going to find, uh, you know, ice, for example, as a long-term treatment option or a or a short-term treatment option. But, you know, if you think about it and use common sense, you can pretty much figure out it's going to be a short-term treatment option. So just think about that as we're going through everything. And I'll, I'll drop little tidbits about whether it's short-term or long-term. Um, and the reality is that a long-term treatment option typically involves the most effort on your part. If you're dealing with a knee problem right now and you're looking at fixing it for the long term, um, just realize that there is no easy way around it. There's no shortcuts. Um, you've got to get stronger. You've got to get you've got to get to the root of the problem. You've got to move better. You've got to figure out how to take pressures off your knees and how to put your knee in a situation where it heals the best. Everything else is pretty much secondary to that. Um, you know, pending any sort of traumatic massive injury where you absolutely need some procedure done. Um, if you haven't had that, if you just if you have knee pain that's developed over time, there wasn't really any big massive injury. Maybe you had a, a old injury in high school or when you were younger and it's just kind of it's been um, following you as you've gone along and getting a little bit worse. That's typically how knee pain comes on. Um, there is a way to get it better naturally without having to rely on surgeries, medications, and injections. Um, but it's going to take some work on your part. It's very doable here in the clinic. We we help people directly with that treatment option, and we have people achieve long-term relief from knee pain, and we have them avoid surgery, avoid injections, and, and uh, stop relying on pain medications. So that being said, think of everything as a short-term treatment option or a long-term treatment option. Let's start with the at-home remedies that people will typically do. So I'm just going to go down a list here. Some of them I'll talk about. Some of them I'll just mention. Ice and heat are one of the most commonly used home remedies for knee pain. It is completely temporary. The ice is thought to... um, uh, numb the area and take away the pain temporarily while your your body part that you're icing is really cold you kind of don't feel the pain and um heat is providing a similar feedback to the body it's it's providing a different sensation so that you don't feel pain now real quick just a side note about this cuz it's going to follow the rest of the the things that we're doing here the 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 home remedies that we're covering here um there's a th- a theory on pain that is called the pain gate theory. Now it's there's holes in it, but but for the sake of simplicity, we're gonna we're gonna use that. The idea is that if you can distract your brain from the pain that you're feeling, then you won't feel pain, and it's beneficial for you to to move on in life at that moment. The classic example is if you ever bump your shin real hard on something that really hurts, and what you reflexively will do is rub your leg right where you got bumped on your leg. Rubbing your leg does not 
heal your shin. It just distracts your brain from feeling the pain that you've caused yourself from hitting your shin. Um, but we do that reflexively. We don't even think about it. You know, you'll grab it, you'll rub it. Um, same thing with bumping your head. Um, that's just what we do. Um, and I think that ice and heat may be similar. I can't tell you for sure. I don't, I'm not, you know, a, an expert in, in researching that kind of stuff. I can just tell you from, from what I've read and, um, what I've seen with patients. So don't look to solve your knee pain problem with ice and heat. It's only going to give you some temporary relief, which is okay because it helps you avoid the next thing over the counter pain medication. Now, some people need to take pain medication for their knee problem. That's cool. Um, you know, if you can't avoid it, it, it definitely can um, hurt your organs over the long term. Um, the idea with over-the-counter pain medication is that you just take it for a short period of time anyway. So if, you, if you're doing that, then you're okay. But if you're relying on pain medication to fall asleep every night or to get through the day because you're going to be on your feet a lot, then that is not a good situation. So some over-the-counter pain medications that you typically see will be um, Tylenol, Advil, Aleve, Excedrin. Uh, these are all different types of, um, of medications. Um, acetaminophen is, is Tylenol. Naproxen and ibuprofen are, are uh, NSAIDs, is something that you might find on the internet, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Um, and they work a little bit differently from, from uh, uh, paracetamol and, and Tylenol, that kind of thing. So um, you've got to be careful when using these over-the-counter the pain medications. Make sure that you're not taking them for the long term. Another, another type of medication that you can get over-the-counter but you don't take by mouth is pain patches. Typically, these are um, using lidocaine. Now, in some places, they're, they're not legal without a doctor's prescription. You have to have a doc doctor's prescription. Some places you can. Um, I'm not an expert in that, so um, you'll have to figure out you know, what, what's available to you in the drugstores. Um, but I have seen people using lidocaine pain patches. They'll put it on their knee. They use them for their back as well and other parts of their body. And um, that can temporarily take away the pain as well. There's other lidocaine pain creams. That's what we'll talk about next is um, uh, uh, lotions or gels that you rub on your knee and uh, can relieve pain temporarily. There's a bunch of brands. Asper Cream is one. Bengay, Icy Hot, Biofreeze, just to name a few. There's dozens others. Uh, Tiger Balm is another one that comes to mind. They all use different types of um, chemicals and products in there. They're all they're all a version of a medication that you're just rubbing in, essentially. Though they, they do penetrate your skin and enter your bloodstream. So although they they're tend to thought of as being safer than taking pain medication by mouth, you're still putting ingredients that are dangerous into your body uh, through your skin, though. And um, I have heard of some extreme cases. You, you have to use a heck of a lot of, of lotion, of these pain lotions, where people have died from using too much um, of certain pain lotions. I'm not sure which one, um, but I'm sure that's super duper rare. You have to like dip your body in one of these lotions pretty much. Um, some other home remedies that people will use are Epsom salt baths. Um, they'll draw a bath, you know, they'll, they'll fill their tub with warm water. And you can get Epsom salts at pretty much any drugstore or grocery store. And you can um, dump that into the, the hot water and soak in it. And some people find some temporary relief from using that. Another option is uh, the trending essential oils. There's a lot of people out there that are that are picking up essential oils. Um, we actually use them here in the office occasionally and, and um, mainly for diffusing. We put them in the air for aromatherapy type stuff. And uh, it's it's not, we don't use it like heavily every day. We, we have some clients that are a little sensitive to odors and stuff. And I myself too, you know, somebody that wears too much uh, perfume or cologne or something like that. It's, it's a little overwhelming sometimes. But um, there is some suspected benefit to certain essential oils. Um, I can't tell you which ones exactly. You have to talk to an essential oils expert um, and rubbing it in onto your skin, kind of like you would these pain creams and getting a, a pain relief benefit from it. Um, but it is temporary. Um, to my understanding, it's not going to fix anything for the long term. Uh, but it might be safer than using um, pain medications. Along the same line of essential oils, um, there's homeopathic alternatives. So we're talking stuff like CBD oil, um, which is a derivative of marijuana. It's the, it's the part of marijuana that's safe to use as far as not making you high. 
Um, it's the pain relieving part. And, uh, you know, there's there's a growing um, market for that right now. More people are getting interested in it. It's it's kind of ambiguous as to whether it's legal or not. I, I'm sure you, you might know about all the controversy surrounding it, and, and or you might not. You, you just got to be careful with where you're using it, when you're using it, all that stuff. Um, I've had clients in the clinic that report they're using it and say that it makes them feel a little bit better. But again, it's just a temporary thing. It's not going to last um, and cure the problem. Um, if you've got knee arthritis or a torn meniscus or torn cartilage or or something, some chronic injury like that that's starting to hurt you, oils are probably not going to be the main factor in fixing this problem. Other homeopathic alternatives are apple cider vinegar, ginger, turmeric. Uh, there's a bunch of other herbs out there. I've heard of patients telling me all kinds of things that they've tried taking. Um, and um, some report some benefits, some refor- re- some say that they hardly notice anything or, or nothing. I haven't had anybody flat out tell me that it made them worse, though, so I, I, I can't speak to it hurting a knee problem. Um, but you, you can try that out. Along the same line, uh, I get asked all the time about supplements, supplements that you should be taking for knee joint health. And the two most common ones that have been around for a long time are are glucosamine and chondroitin. Um, You can find these in all kinds of forms. Typically they're in in pill form. You you can go buy a bottle of glucosamine and chondroitin, usually combined into the same tablet at at the store, at a drugstore. And um, there's a decent amount of research on it. What I've gathered from reading the research is that some people benefit from it, some don't. I haven't seen that anybody gets hurt from it, though, so it's worth a shot if um, that's something that you want to try out. And and, uh, going along the next step from supplements, diet is something else that people often try at home. They'll avoid inflammatory foods. Um, and th- those tend to be foods that are high in sugars, um, lactose as well, which is uh, found in milk. I've heard of that being a, a big one. And um, they'll go more for anti-inflammatory foods. So you're talking more plant-type foods and, um, and weight management along with that. So making sure that you know, your, your weight's in the proper range so that uh, you're not putting too much forces through your knees. So that's that's a process, though, as as everybody is probably familiar with dieting. Um, that's that's tough. It's it's definitely possible um, to lose weight and manage your weight. But I've had people too that are in great health as far as their weight, and um, you know they they eat pretty healthy. Telling me from what they eat in their diet, and they still have knee problems. So there's there's other factors as well besides diet that can influence your knee. Um, but it's definitely going to help you out on other fronts. If you've if you've got some weight to lose, going on a diet is not at all a bad idea. Um, next on the list, we've got massage. So massaging, whether it's done by a, a professional or it's done uh, on your by yourself or you know a family member or something like that, massage on the thigh and hip muscles, uh, leg muscles can definitely relieve some knee pain. I've seen that happen. We actually do it here in the clinic, but it is short lived. There's other things that need to happen along with the massage. And then the way that the massage happens and where the massage is exactly as far as the the techniques used, the forces used, the muscles worked on, um, there's quite a bit of detail to it. So we have clients that try self massage and and get a pretty good effect from it. And then we have others that that get frustrated because they feel like their knee gets worse doing it. Um, So just watch out with using self-massage or getting a massage from a professional as well. If you go to a massage therapist, um, you you just got to be careful about what their training's in, what their background's in as far as, um, you know, are they doing more spa type massage, like relaxation massages, which is cool. You might want that and that's fine. But if you're going to one of those types of massage therapists to get a knee treated, you got to think about that plan. You might want to see somebody who's got some pretty good experience in doing massage on knee problems. The next thing on our list is stretches and exercises. We get people in the clinic all the time that are showing us their stretches and exercises that they've been trying on their own. Um, They may have learned them from the internet, from YouTube, from Google. They may have gotten them from family or friends. Um, or they may have been stretches and exercises they learned uh, from a 
from a trainer or from when they were doing sports in school. People pull out all kinds of things um, and, and they get them from all sorts of places. And that's cool. A lot of times it, it benefits them. They, they feel better in their knee problems. Sometimes, though, it does make it worse. And you've got to be careful with that. The body is complex. There's over 400 muscles in the body. And um, understanding how they all work together and influence the joints and nerves and ligaments, cartilage, all the different body parts in there is complicated. And um, if you've been trying stretches or exercises and haven't really been getting much luck, um, then I strongly suggest you um, get some professional help on that because that's that can be harmful in the long term. And um, at, at, like with, with stretches and exercise, I got to tell you, we we use some of those in the clinic here. There's a, a component of what we do is is exercising, um, but it's in combination with a bunch of other things. It's rarely just one thing that makes somebody recover for the long term from a knee problem. So it's really about finding the right mix of treatment approaches for you, which means you got to try different things. You got to maybe get some expert help sometimes to point you in the right direction. Um, You've got to figure out what works best for you. There isn't a a one thing. It's rare that one thing helps fix a long-term knee problem. Next on the list, we've got sleeves, like uh, knee sleeves. Uh, You know, these are the types that you buy at athletic stores. Um, or like a Walmart, and you you slide it up onto your leg, it gives you some compression. Um, a variation of that would be braces. The The difference for me between a sleeve and a brace, a sleeve you just slide on, and it's it's compressive on your knee. A brace you'll slide on, and then you usually have to strap straps around your leg to cinch it down. And many times they have brackets built into the sides that, that stabilize your knee. Um, some of these sleeves and braces are infused with certain materials like copper. You hear about the copper sleeves all the time. They're pretty heavily marketed. Um, and some are not. There's other materials out there that they, that they think that are um, helpful for, for knee health. Magnets is another one that I've seen. Um, and uh, all of these braces can provide some immediate relief in, in uh, certain knee braces. And in fact, um, when I see clients with certain knee problems... I make a brace part of their treatment plan for a certain period of time because it, especially if you've got a ligament injury, uh, we're talking like an ACL or an MCL um, or some other related ligament, it almost always requires bracing for a period of time to let that ligament heal. Um, but that's expert advice that I'm giving patients after I've checked out their ligaments, after I've watched other things about them, learned other things in talking to them and have been able to determine that that's a component of what they need to get better for the long term. If you're at home and you're, you're trying a brace or a sleeve, um, make make sure that you have some guidance on when to get off the brace or sleeve because if you have it on too long, that could cause some problems. And it's not a good idea to use a brace or sleeve for the long term, you know, indefinitely. You need to have an end point. Um, so you got to have a, a good reason to put it on and a good reason to take it off. Um, you might be trying it to see how it feels better. That's definitely a good reason. Um, but you got to know when it's time to get out of the brace. Uh, related to braces are wraps, you know, like your ACE wraps. Those are those long strips of stretchy cloth that you can wrap around your knee. Those are typically used for a, a fresh injury, like somebody that that's playing sports and just hurt their knee. Um, or, but I see, I've seen people use them at home as well. And and those can be beneficial. Um, they'll use that in combination with putting on some sort of cream or homeopathic concoction, um, you know, using uh, other stuff that I talked about earlier, uh, just to add compression and also get the other effect from the, the creams and medications and, and herbs that they've put on. And, um, I think that's cool. That's definitely a, a great way to avoid, uh, you know, harmful medications that could, damage your organs. Um, so wraps can be beneficial for sure. Straps is another one. So the I, I used one of these when I was going through high school. Um, there's different types of straps out there. One of the most common ones is called a jumper's knee strap. And it's literally a, a thin strap, maybe an inch, an inch and a half wide that you wrap around your knee. And the part that sits on the front of your knee usually has a little tube on it that puts pressure right under your kneecap. And um, I actually remember using this in high school, and it did feel better. Um, they they use it for jumper's knee, something that happens. Uh, it's a, a pain that happens right below the kneecap to people that are involved in 
running sports and sports that involve some jumping. When using these uh, knee straps, you know, they slide on with Velcro, so they're not, they don't stay on the best, especially if you're really active. Um, but they are just a temporary thing. They don't fix a long-term knee problem. And it's not a good idea to wear that long-term along with the, um, the sleeves and the braces and wraps idea. More and more, there's been a increase in people purchasing their own electrical stimulation units for home use. Um, another name for these are TENS units, T-E-N-S. That stands for Trans Electric Trans Cutaneous Electrical Neural Stimulation. And all it is is a little machine that you put batteries in. It's got wires that attach to these sticky pads that you put around the area that hurts. It's usually got a an on switch and a dial, and you dial up the intensity. And and there's other settings on there that might um, you'll get little electrical signals that go through the pads and it, you can turn it all the way up to where it makes your muscle contract usually and it, it, it the frequency of how often it it turns off and on um, you, you can vary with it there's all kinds of little settings you can put on these machines um, the research around these machines are that they do help with pain so they can actually take away pain i think it's along that same line of of you know hitting your shin and and if you rub it you get distracted from the pain I think it's a similar effect to get with this because what the research also tells us is that the the machine stops helping you after you take it off, obviously, right? So that just means that it's a short-term effect. The machine only really helps you out when you have it on and it's sending little electri- electrical signals to your body, um, but the pain usually comes back right after you take off the machine. These are commonly found in uh, chiropractic and physical therapy offices and I think they're cool. They, you know, they use them and they can provide you some relief for sure. Um, they might, in, in an office like that, they might put a hot pack on over the electrical stimulation pads and it typically feels really nice. They'll do it for anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes. Um, but you just always have to question how effective is this in fixing my knee pain for the long term? Because if I got a knee problem right now, I sure as heck don't want to be dealing with it in six months or in 12 months or even next month. I want it gone. I don't want just temporary relief because everybody wants to get to the fun parts of life, right? You want to be able to go travel, do fun stuff, be with family, be with friends, exercise, uh, be able to be active, feel comfortable doing whatever the heck you want. And um, this electrical stimulation machine is not going to get you there. It's just going to give you some temporary relief. Up next on the list of things to try at home is shoes. So many people will say, well, my knees have been hurting. And you know what? These shoes are really old. I've had them for over a year. And look at them. They're all worn down. You can't even see the, the treads on the bottom anymore. And uh, I'm sure the, the the sole of the shoe is all, it's lost its cushion. You hear all kinds of things. And and yes, I agree that, you know, get keeping some adequate shoes um on your feet whenever you're active some shoes that are that are adequately cushioned adequately um, uh, treaded because you need that grip Um, basically you should have some good shoes on pretty much all the time Um, that is a good thing for you but chances are that your knee problem is not just coming from the shoes that's rarely ever the long-term fix Um, You might get some good relief, actually. People that change their shoes out and and find that it really helps out their knees, they might be better for a while. Um, And it could last, you know, six to 12 months, about the same time frame that the shoes begin to wear out again and they need new shoes. Um, But I always have to look up the chain of joints and muscles and see what's going on at the hip, what's going on at the knee, the muscles around the, the thigh. And those things are not influenced directly from the shoes. Um, usually the foot position, the, the foot muscles um, have to be addressed as well. Along that same um, topic, insoles in shoes are something else that people go to get. And I think those are great. They can make a huge difference in the position of your ankle and foot, supporting your arch or, or supporting your heel, depending on what you need. Um, and But that's a confusing thing to go shop for, you know, especially if you're on your own and you're trying to pick out the right pair of shoes or the right pair of insoles to slip into your shoes. Um, Another name for insoles is orthotics, and some people will go to um, podiatrists to get orthotics, or or there's certain stores out there that sell high-end insoles or or orthotics. And I think they're generally good. 
Um, occasionally the complete bad fit will make your foot hurt more or your knee hurt more. So you just got to be careful. There's a bit of trial and error with that. Um, but uh, keep in mind that if you're not very strong up top, if you're not moving very well, if you've got other issues, shoes are only going to solve a, a small piece of the problem. Um, but it's worth a shot to see how big of a problem it solves for you. Now, the last few things we're going to go into here are definitely more extreme, but um, I've seen people do it. And um, so I, I won't put it past anybody here um, to try on their own. I have seen people using crutches for the long term. I mean, where they won't even put weight through their leg. They'll, they'll, they would rather be on crutches for months on end, um, years even, uh, because their knee hurts so much and they're afraid to use their leg. Um, so, you know, crutches are okay in the short term. Uh, maybe, you know, a, a few weeks, uh, maybe over a month at most, but there needs to come a time where you put pressure through your leg and you need to start using your leg normally again so that your knee can act like a normal knee again. Um, so long-term use of crutches is not a good idea. But if you just got hurt and you need to get around, definitely crutches can be a, a good plan for the the immediate future. Canes and walkers are other um, variations of crutches, essentially. Um, now, a cane and a walker is is, is definitely a more long-term device to use, and you typically see older people using them, but I'm not opposed to making somebody who's younger, you know, say a person in their 40s or 50s or even younger using a cane or walker when it's appropriate. But generally, the idea with the cane or walker is like the crutches that you you should be able to get out from using it. Canes and walkers are helpful for people with balance problems. And if you've got a knee injury and you can't support yourself very well on your knee, whether it's arthritis, a ligament problem, a cartilage problem, a meniscal problem, um, it's likely going to affect your muscles over time, which will affect your balance over time. So for some people, they will need to be using a cane or walker for a longer period of time, but it may not solve their knee pain problem. So it's important to still look at what needs to happen exercise-wise, movement-wise, naturally to fix a knee pain problem. And that's what's going to set this person up to get away from the cane and walker and have the confidence to go out and walk in the public, you know, unfamiliar areas, on gravel, on uneven ground, going up and down stairs, um, being able to, to uh, go up and down the, the curb or, or small steps um, in public so that you can feel that you're not going to fall or not further injure your knee. And um, the most extreme thing that I have ever seen, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm in El Paso, of course, which is in, in uh, the southwest of the United States. And we're in the desert, so it's definitely warmer than many other places in the country. I have seen some people that have had long-standing knee arthritis uh, that lived up north that moved down south where it's warm because their knee feels better in warmer weather versus colder weather. And, you know, the people that I met that did this, they love El Paso. They love being in warmer weather anyway. So it wasn't like a like that was their only reason for moving. Um, but I just thought it was interesting. And, and I'm sure it's crossed some people's minds out there. Maybe I should move to where it's warmer so my knee won't hurt so much. Maybe I should move to where it's sunnier and there's not so much rain and clouds so that my knee won't hurt so much or my back. I, I hear people talking about their back hurting with the weather as well. Um, so that is another thing that people will try at home and um, it may affect it. I, I honestly can't tell you how effective that is. Um, the people that I met that did that said that it helped, but they were still see seeing me here in the office for knee for pain with their knee problem. Um, so I, I doubt that it's a cure for a knee problem. There's other things to look at. All right. So great job on hanging with me. We're going to go into the medical field next and talk about the other treatment options that are available to you through the medical field. So you have to be able to go see a specialist to access these things. Now, most people will first visit their family doctor, their general doctor, you know, a physician. They might even see a nurse practitioner, physician's assistants for this. And, um, you know, if you show up to one of these people with your knee problem and you tell them that you know, your knee started hurting, it's been swelling, you can't walk, for very long or you you know you have it feels stiff when you're standing um it, it, there's different reasons why your knee might hurt they'll they'll evaluate you and and kind of 
figure out what's going on so that they can give you a diagnosis. They may order x-rays. Uh, they may do them there in the office or send you somewhere. They may also order an MRI if they feel that that's the next best step. Um, and um, more often than not, they'll prescribe you drugs. And that's their specialty. They're, they're, you know, a physician is an MD, which is a doctor of medicine. Um, so their specialty is telling people what drugs to take or not take. And um, the common drugs that are prescribed for a knee problem are steroids, muscle relaxers, and opioids. Um, so these are prescription pain medications, different from the over-the-counter pain medications. Although some doctors will definitely tell you to start with the over-the-counter stuff. They'll tell you, go get a bottle of aspirin or Tylenol um, and, uh, and start there or get some ibuprofen and start there. Um, or they may prescribe you the prescription dosage of those medicines, or they may just give you the prescription medications that you can't get over the counter. Um, some of the most common steroids that they'll prescribe are prednisone or prednisolone. Um, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing uh, all these medications. If you're in the medical field out there and you're like, oh, you said it wrong. I'm a physical therapist. I, I stay out of that place in the medical field. I'm just covering it right now just to give people a, a good example of, of what they'll encounter. Um, but I am never prescribing these to patients. I just hear about them and I, I know these are commonly used medications. Um, my specialty is in helping people avoid having to rely on medications. It's okay to use them for a short while, of course, but you don't want to be taking these, this stuff long term. It damages parts of your body that you need for the rest of your life. Another type of medication that people will, will often get prescribed are muscle relaxers. Some common ones are Flexeril, Soma, Xanaflex, and Robaxin. Um, if you're taking one of these, you might find that you're pretty drowsy when you take these. Um, they are very much like um, tranquilizers. So they do make your muscles relax, but not just the muscle that is hurting your knee. All of them will relax. So a lot of people don't function too well on these muscle relaxers. They feel like they have to sleep all the time. They'll use them to sleep usually, but some people will take them during the day as instructed by their doctor. And and um, I've had patients come in and tell me, I can't work. I can't be with my family. I can't do anything while I'm on these muscle relaxers. And my knee feels better, but I've lost all these other parts of my life because I'm having to take this medication right now. Another medication that is often prescribed for knee pain is antidepressants, surprisingly. Um, now, of course, these are used for depression, but they have found that there's pain relieving effects in many antidepressants. So some of the common ones that are prescribed are Celexa, Prozac, Zoloft, and Cymbalta. And certain dosages are known to relieve pain in some people. And once the doctor has determined once your general doctor has determined which medication or combination of medications that they want to prescribe you, and of course you decide if you want that or not, you have to figure out what's best for you, um, then they might refer you to a specialist. And when they're talking about a specialist, they're, they're usually talking about a surgeon, like an orthopedic doctor, um, and, and another name for it would be an orthopod, um, an orthopedic surgeon, an, an orthopedist as well. And these specialist types of doctors um, usually do orthopedic surgery. So they're, they're doing different types of knee surgeries and other surgeries too. Um, another type of specialist you might get referred to are uh, pain management doctors, which can do some procedures as well, but um, are trained in uh, pain relieving um, treatments. So that might include me medicines, injections. They'll, they'll, those are the guys that bring out the big medications. Um, so if you end up seeing a pain management doctor, um, they might be the type of doctor that prescribes opioids. Now, just a quick word about opioid pain medications. Um, if you know anything about pain medication in the medical field, there's, you, you might be aware that there's been a controversy in the use of, the, of them in the prescription. They can be addictive because they're derivatives of opium. And um, so some people feel like they need them to function. Um, they are very good pain relievers, but they can be dangerous and addictive. So always think about that and talk to your doctor about that and, and uh, make sure that you're following best practices with the doctor um, on using these opioid medications. But, you know, I'm not 
here to tell you don't take them completely. You, you got to decide for yourself what's best for you um, because it's your body, it's your life. You've got to think about what's at stake. Um, you know, I always tell patients if you're pretty grumpy right now because of your knee problem or you're pretty limited or, or you're just in a spot where you have to get around right now and your knee's not letting you, you know, maybe some medication is a good idea in the short term, but please, please, please be working on a long-term solution so that you're not having to rely on these pain medications. So back to the pain management docs, um, some common opioid medications that they might prescribe are codeine, fentanyl, Vicodin, Percocet, um, and these drugs are used for a variety of different problems, but one of those might be your knee. Um, so if you go see the, the pain management doctor, you might get prescribed an opioid drug. Um, other things that pain management doctors um, can do are injections. They can do pain injections. There's different types of medicines that they'll inject into your knee. Um, and they do some procedures as well. One of the common procedures that are done in pain management clinics are something called RFA, radiofrequency ablation, um, which basically is uh, where they go into your back and burn a nerve using radio frequencies that connects to your knee so that you don't feel the pain. So it's essentially shutting off the nerve or cutting off the nerve that uh, feels pain in your knee. And um, it's got mixed uh, efficacy. In other words, it, it sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. I think it's a pretty questionable technique. And, you know, I'm not a pain management doctor, so I, I'll, I'll never tell a pain management doctor not to do it. That's their field. That's their decision, of course. And, of course, as a patient, you've got to decide if you want that done. Um, but what I, whenever patients come and talk to me about it, I always tell them, hey, well, just think about what all the other things that are controlled by this nerve and what's going to happen if you lose this nerve and I don't know the research on the nerve growing back. There's there's all these questionable things when, when it comes to radio frequency ablations. So um, I would just make sure you think twice, maybe get a second opinion and see if that's the best option for you. Now let's talk about the other types of specialists out there, the orthopods, the ortho, orthopedic surgeons. Um, those doctors will also do injections on your knee. Um, commonly they're injecting something called cortisone, which is a type of steroid that um, is pretty effective at, at relieving pain and also reducing inflammation. Now, a word about inflammation. Inflammation is the first step in healing. That's supposed to happen. In the medical field and in, I think in, in um, our culture in general, inflammation is seen as bad. And, um, and absolutely, too much inflammation can be a bad thing. But it is really the first step in healing in the body. And without that step, it's impossible to move on to the next step. So if you're constantly getting some sort of anti-inflammatory and anti-inflammation drug put into your body, you're really limiting your healing. Um, and, and so therefore, it's it's got to be a short-term solution because you're, you're focused more on getting rid of the pain rather than fixing the problem for the long term. If you're fixing the problem for the long term, you've got to go through some inflammation and get to the next step to where everything can heal properly so that you can get back to life as usual. So so um, back to the injections, there's other things that doctors are injecting out there. Um, Synvisc is a new product that I've heard about. Um, it's, it's a high, high I'm going to chop this word up, hyaluronin is what it's made out of. And uh, my understanding of this is that it's a, um, a, a fluid that's injected into the knee to kind of act as your normal knee joint fluid and cushion and help heal the inside of the knee. And um, it sounds great in theory. I, I really can't tell you if it's working or not. You'd have to talk to your orthopedic surgeon who does this kind of injection because not all of them will do it. Um, I know that it's not covered by most insurances because it's so new and um, I, I can't tell you any pricing on that kind of stuff. You'll, you'll have to ask your doctor about it. Um, but it still does not account for the strength up in your hip, strength in your, in your knee, strength in your lower leg, the way that you're moving. There's all these other natural things that still need to be addressed. So in my opinion, it still falls under the short-term solutions. Other things that are injected are PRP, platelet-rich plasma, 
and stem cells. These are um, newer in the regenerative medicine department. That's kind of a growing field. Regenerative medicine means that you're getting your um, uh, tissues to regenerate. You're trying to heal your tissues. Um, PRP is probably more commonly done. Um, stem cells is kind of questionable because it's its legality is questioned. It's um, uh, controversial as to where the source of the stem cells are, uh, which I won't go into on this podcast. It's a whole other topic and conversation. Um, but it's hard to find a doctor that even does the stem cells. or It's just not commonly done right now. Um, but th- those are options for you. Now, typically, an orthopedic surgeon will try injections first. Of course, you would have already tried oral pain medications, maybe other types of home remedies. Um, and uh, what typically happens if you don't get the relief that you're looking for is the surgeons with all their good intent will then recommend surgery, uh, especially if you've got something that they can repair surgically or help you out with surgery. Um, so some of the common surgeries that are done on the knee are ACL reconstructions, which is a, a repair of the ACL ligament that tends to happen in younger people, but it can even happen in middle age and older people. Um, a lateral meniscus repair, a medial meniscus repair is another one. Um, that's where they go in and fix the big chunk of cartilage inside your knee. They, they might um, also do a, a partial meniscectomy, which is where they take out a chunk of cartilage from your knee. Um, and then some of the, the more experimental surgeries out there are microfracture, where they will drill small holes into areas where there's less cartilage in the knee, where the cartilage has worn down or it might be bone on bone in that area. And uh, that surgery is tough because it, it does take a, a very specific rehabilitation afterwards um, because the idea is that from those drills, those holes that they drill into the bone, they're trying to stimulate the cartilage to grow back. And that just takes a long time. Um, uh, The more common extreme surgeries that are done are partial knee replacements and total knee replacements. Um, And uh, those are done, gosh, there's probably tons of them done every day. And uh, they've gotten really good at those. They're pretty effective surgeries. If you've got severe knee arthritis, Um, and you just can't bend or straighten out your knee. And it's been, usually it's been a problem for over a decade, maybe decades. Then that's when surgeons will recommend doing a a replacement type of surgery on your knee. Now I have seen this next one just once and, um, I question it definitely. Um, now I don't, I'm not a surgeon, uh, nowhere near it. I never want to be a surgeon. Um, but I don't know that I'd ever allow, I'd have to have a heck of a good reason to allow a surgeon to do this on me. Um, But I had one patient that had a knee problem. This has been years and years and years ago, and it was a different town. Um, And they, they, she was just obsessed with finding the root of the knee problem. And uh, before she got to physical therapy where I was working, um, she had seen several doctors, seen several physicians, seen several specialists, seen, tried all kinds of um, medications, and she was young. She was in her early 30s. Um, and what what they were telling her was that there's nothing on her MRI that looks like it's repairable. So there's no surgery that they recommended. Um, she continued to persist. And uh, one day she walked in and said, I had exploratory surgery, which means they went into her knee surgically, put a camera in there to look for what was wrong. And um, in, and now I was charged with helping her recover from the, the cuts that were made and the procedure that was done on her knee. Um, and she still had knee problems afterwards. They didn't find anything. So um, I, I don't know that I would recommend doing that exploratory surgery. You'd have to, of course, talk to your doctor and, and uh, figure out if that's the best choice for you. But that's another option that I've seen done. We're exhaustive today. All right, let's get into physical therapy next. So we're done with talking about the home remedies. We talked about family doctors and the medications they can prescribe. Then we talked about specialist surgeons and and pain management doctors. Um, Now let's talk about physical therapy, a very common treatment done for knee problems. There's all kinds of types of physical therapy. Let me start with the most common. That's exercise-based physical therapy. Um, Now, before I keep going, realize that most PT clinics don't really specialize, if you will. They don't really um, 
tell you that they're exercise based or whatever they're they're focused in. Most clinics kind of do a bit of everything. So um, it depends on which therapists you work with and which clinic you're at, even within a, a one business that has multiple locations, they may have equipment at one location that they don't have at another equi- lo- location. And so what you do in treatment will, will kind of tell you which kind of therapy you're doing. And, and you have to decide if that's right for you or if you need a mix of things. Um, so you got to figure that out. But by and large, just about every physical therapy clinic is going to make you do some sort of exercise. And that's generally good. Um, exercise is known to help knee problems. Um, but like I said earlier, if you've been trying stretches and exercises at home and you found that it hurt you, um, same thing in physical therapy, you've got to communicate with your physical therapist about what exercises they might have you doing that is bothering your knee, um, making it swell afterwards, or uh, just not letting you walk normal the next days after you do a physical therapy visit. Um, they'll usually send you home with exercises as well. And um, you've got to communicate with your therapist about if that's helping or hurting or, or what the expectations should be. Because sometimes it might need to hurt a bit, especially if, you've, if you're recovering from a surgery. Um, but most of the time, especially if you haven't had a surgery, it should feel better and better each time you exercise. Um, but an exercise-based physical therapist f- physical therapy session will pretty much have all exercise. You'll go in there and you'll do a bunch of different exercises. There might be bands involved like big colorful rubber bands or might be um, machines involved you might get on a bike on a treadmill um, elliptical there's uh, weight machines you might use there's all kinds of things that that you might do um, to rehab your knee and uh, for a lot of people that's beneficial Um, it just depends on your type of knee problem another type of physical therapy that is seen out there is aquatic physical therapy and the premise with aquatic physical therapy is that when you're in, in a pool, when you're in a water, especially when the water's up to your chest or higher up to your neck, for instance, the buoyancy of your body in the water takes pressure off your knee. And, and then when you exercise in the water, you're exercising with less pressure on your knee and also the resistance of the water as you move your leg, the water pushes against you. And so that there's a, a small strengthening effect that happens with your knee. And um, that's, I think that's really cool for some people. That's what they need. Um, this tends to actually work really well in, in uh, people that are very obese and trying to find some knee, some knee relief. Um, because, you know, if, if you've, for instance, if you weigh 300 pounds when you're supposed to weigh, you know, under 200, um, or, or if you weigh more than that, um, and if uh, for whatever reason the weight's there, if it's some thyroid issue or if it's, you know, if it's just a health problem that you haven't been able to successfully address, that's okay. But you need knee, knee relief right now so that you can get to exercising and help out your weight problem. Um, aquatic physical therapy might be a great alternative for you. So give that a shot. Um, and, and that might be the best place to start re- rehabilitating your knee. Another version of this, but that doesn't involve water is anti-gravity physical therapy. So what that means is uh, there's there's machines out there that can take weight off of you. Usually you get strapped in. There's, there's all different kinds. Um, the popular ones right now will put you on a treadmill. Um, so there's devices out there called the Ultra G. Um, gosh, I forgot all the names. There's, there's so many now. Ultra G is the one that comes to mind. Um, but the idea with all these different machines is that they, there's some contraption, some either clothing or harness that you wear that attaches to the machine. And depending on the settings of the machine, it, it lifts you it, it, and you can usually set the poundage. So, for instance, if you weigh 200 pounds, you can tell the machine to take off 40 pounds. So then now you weigh 160 pounds or whatever it might be. And then you would walk with only 160 pounds rather than 200 and and uh, depending on the settings and how how you're doing the exercise, that can be very beneficial for your knee as well. Um, some of the more up and coming treatment options through physical therapy are um, blood flow restriction therapy and dry needling. Now, with blood flow restriction therapy, um, this is probably the newest one. Uh, they're what 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 is happening is they're trying to increase strength in certain muscles, and. Um, what what is what they're doing is putting 
a strap around your thigh and this strap has a bladder in it that you can pump air into so that it constricts your thigh and, and therefore restricts the blood flow. That's why it's called blood flow restriction therapy. Um, and then the idea is you exercise so that you make that those, those thigh muscles work and it deprives the muscle of the blood and oxygen that's in the blood, which sets up a situation where the muscle might strengthen faster than normal. And um, it's really cool. It's a really cool concept. Um, it's new. It hasn't been fully researched well, in my opinion. Um, and it hasn't really taken as being super popular and, and uh, you know, something that is going to help everybody or help a lot of people out. So I, I have not incorporated it in treatment. I don't think that it's a, a, a good long term solution. And, um, you know, you might think, well, I do need more strength. And, and yeah, you probably do. If you've got a knee problem, I'd say 9.9 .9 out of 10 people tend to need more strength in certain muscles. But that's the key is with this blood flow restriction therapy, you can only strengthen certain muscles and only do it in a certain way. You're limited on the number of exercises you could do, the, the, the way the movements occur. It's not teaching you proper movement and it might be strengthening muscles that don't need to be strengthened and could actually harm your knee. For example, in many knee problems, I see people that have way too dominant quadricep muscles, the muscles in the front of the thigh, and blood flow restriction therapy tends to help people get stronger quads. Well, if you've got dominant quad muscles and then you go further strengthen those quad muscles, it's likely going to aggravate your knee over time. So you got to be careful with that. And, and um, you know, as an expert physical therapist, I can tell you that that is not common knowledge and even physical therapists may not grasp that. And, and that's the field that should, you know, and, and surgeons may kind of get that, but their specialty is doing surgery. Um, doctors of medicine may grasp that to a bit, but their special specialty is medicines. Um, so in the exercise and movement realm in physical therapy, it's probably the, the lesser researched of the two. Um, there's a lot of people that are figuring out how to do this and more research is still being conducted. It's a growing field in research. So um, I'm not... I'm not saying don't go try it. I'm saying go try it, but make sure that you pay close attention to what your symptoms are, how you're feeling, and if it's helping you or not. And if it's not helping you, it might be because of that. You're, you're strengthening muscles that don't need to be strengthened. The other up and coming thing is dry needling. Dry needling is really interesting. It's a lot like acupuncture um, as far as the needles that they use and the way that, that the needles are put into your body. Um, but it's very different from acupuncture in the response that happens. Now, um, I love acupuncture. I've gotten it myself. I think that it's fantastic. And and um, I recommend it to clients as an alternative to using pain medications. I, I occasionally get clients that say, you know, I have a, allergic reactions to certain pain medications, so I'm just not even going to take them. I'll deal with the pain. Um, but if the pain's bad enough, um, I'll tell them, go see a, a, an acupuncturist and they might be able to help you out with some pain relief. And and the ones that I've worked with have done a great job. Um, but dry needling is different from acupuncture. In acupuncture, the needles go in and uh, they do other stuff that's I'm not familiar with. It's Eastern medicine. I don't know how it works exactly. I can't, I'm not even going to try to explain it, but somehow it works. Um, it's not painful. It tends to be relaxing, in fact. And um, the needles going into your skin in acupuncture feels just like some pressure, occasionally a little sting. I can tell you, um, paper. I've had paper cuts that are a hundred times more painful than the most painful acupuncture needle I've ever felt. So um, it really is is not painful. I've never been to acupuncture that has that I've regretted going to or that I was in agony at. It, it, it always has felt fantastic. I, I feel great. Dry needling is different though. When you get poked with a dry needle, they are sometimes pistoning the, the needle, which means they're pulling the needle in and out like a piston in, a, in an engine, and they're trying to make the muscle spasm. Now, if you've ever had a muscle spasm like in your back or, or a cramp happen in your leg, that's what they're trying to get to happen in your body part that they're needling, that they're dry needling. And um, it hurts. It, it You're going to feel the muscle contract really hard. Um, you're going to move and, and, you know, strain for a few seconds while the cramp happens, while the muscle spasms. 
and then they take out the needle and they might do a few different body parts. It just depends on, on um, how experienced the therapist is at doing dry needling and, and what their goal is. Um, but after the effects of the spasm wear off, typically there is relief in pain. But I always question is, is this a long-term treatment? And I would have to say, no, it's definitely a short-term pain relief solution. It's, it's, a, it's a great way to avoid medications that are hurting your organs if you're taking those for a long time. It's something else to do just to get you through a part where you have to exercise and it's painful or to get you through a part of your life that you just, you can't be in pain because you're being grumpy or you got to work. It is a pain relieving technique. Let's go to the last one. And, you know, I'm biased. I'm a manual therapist. I'm going to talk about manual therapy, but I truly believe that this is a fantastic way to long-term cure a knee problem. And when I say manual therapy, I'm talking about the way that I practice, which is in combination with some other things. I'll use exercise. Um, I'll use strengthening. I'll use some stretching as well. I, I talk about the patient with, uh, I talk to the patient about modifications in their life, uh, the way they exercise, the way they sit and stand, walk. So there's a combination of things that I'm using. But if we're talking about manual therapy alone, just to define it, what that is doing for the knee uh, is, is, it is hands-on techniques um, by somebody who's trained in manual therapy and getting them to move the joints or move soft tissues as well. So it could be muscles, tendons, ligaments, that are not moving properly so that they can make the mechanics of the knee operate better. And depending on your knee problem, if uh, say for instance, you've got a cartilage issue or a meniscal issue in your knee, this can be extremely beneficial and many times can create some pretty instant relief. It may not solve the knee problem for the long term. I I think it definitely is a short-term solution, but when used in combination, with strengthening the right muscles, learning how to walk better, learning how to run better, um, changing your exercise routine so that it's helpful rather than harmful for your knee problem. That, as part of a knee treatment plan, that like what we do here at El Paso Manual Physical Therapy, is what allows an individual to eventually not need the manual therapy, the hands-on treatment anymore, and be able to self-manage and confidently go exercise, confidently go take care of their home and work and all the things that they have to do without feeling like they're going to make their knee worse or end up having to have surgery someday that they could have avoided. Um, So those are all the big things there that can help you out with knee problems. That was a pretty exhaustive list. We're coming up on an hour on this episode. I did not think that it would take that long to go through all this, but um, I was as exhaustive as I could be in talking about all the things that you could possibly do for a knee pain problem. El Paso, I hope that you are doing well. If you've got a knee problem out there, if you um, are looking for more tips and guidance, you can head over to our website, epmanualphysicaltherapy.com, and you'll find um, uh, tips guides that you can download and and get sent to your email inbox immediately um, to start working on some things at home, some specific, some more specific advice on exercises and stretches and, and other things that you can do. If you think that you might want to hire us to help you, or at least just consult, you know, have a, have a one-time visit with us to, to figure out if, if we can even help you, um, you can do that. And, uh, the, the best way to get started is by giving us a call at 915-503-1314. And we'll be happy to at least talk to you on the phone and meet with you in person, of course, um, but um, I just wanted to do this podcast to go over everything that I've ever heard and known about that can help out your knee problem so that you can kind of know where to start, figure out what you've tried and what maybe things that you haven't tried, things that you're not comfortable trying, know the, the upsides and the downsides of everything um, so that you can make the best decision possible about how to proceed with fixing your knee problem. Have the best day ever. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for listening to the Stay Healthy El Paso podcast, brought to you by El Paso Manual Physical Therapy, where we help El Pasoans get away from taking pain medications, avoid getting injections, avoid surgery, and keeping up an active lifestyle. If you'd like to learn more about what El Paso Manual Physical Therapy can do for you, call 915-503-1314 or visit our website at epmanualphysicaltherapy.com. Mention this podcast for a free discovery visit valued at $100. 
If you enjoyed what you've heard, please be sure to leave a review on iTunes and follow the show on your favorite listening platform so you won't miss an upcoming episode. Tune in next time to get the best health tips from experts in the El Paso area.